I would like to thank everyone who is attending today. Today we will continue from uh, last week and we will finish talking about systematic reviews and meta-analysis. So no disclosures. We talked about our objectives last time that in the first session we defined the process and provided the rationale for systematic reviews and meta-analysis. And then today we are going to talk about some advanced concepts uh, such as the risk of bias, heterogeneity, uh, fixed and random effects, publication bias, and some other advanced concepts. And then at the end I will introduce to you the user's guide to the medical literature framework for reading or consuming a systematic review and meta-analysis. Consuming means being on the receiving end, not on the generating end. So, so a lot of the talk will be about how to do a systematic review, but this last part will be about how to read it, understand it, and apply it. So last time I showed you this, these two pictures. Uh, the top one is for to, to remind you of what a systematic review is, and these are the steps of selecting the studies. And we talked about doing the literature search and going through the abstracts and, and full text screening, data extraction. So that's the top figure. Then the bottom figure was the forest plot or the meta-analysis where we have effect size from every uh, study with a confidence interval. And then uh, we have multiple studies. We have the pooled effect size here in the bottom in yellow. And then the line of no effect is uh, in the center here. Uh, so I, I put these two pictures so that if you if you want to think of one picture to remember what a systematic review is, remember the top picture. If this one here, if you want to um, think of one thing that reminds you of what meta-analysis is, remember that this is where we actually do statistics and this will be the bottom one here. And this Venn diagram was there to remind you that you can do a systematic review without a meta-analysis and vice versa, but the most helpful for decision making is to have both. And just a quick reminder, last time we talked uh, about what a meta-analysis estimate is, and we said that it's a uh, pooled estimate. It's an average. However, it's not a simple average. It is a um, weighted average in which the weight, the weight that's given to every study is the inverse or some measure of the inverse of the variance. In other words, it's something that will make big studies impact the average more than smaller study. And we presented how you can get a weighted mean. Now this approach um, ap applies to all different analysis models. Uh, the way it's described here, it represents the fixed effect. Uh, there will be some variations of it that I will talk about today, but uh, in all of them, really the, the, the weight that's given to a study is some sort of a um, measure of precision. We went through the steps of a systematic review. I'm just going to run through them quickly where we formulated the question, defined our eligibility criteria in a protocol. We defined a priori hypothesis to explain inconsistency, which means why studies are different from each other. Uh, there was the search, screening abstracts and full text and data extraction and then assessing the risk of bias, which we will talk about now. Um, and then we have a description of our outcome and data. And at, at, up to this point, this is a narrative process. It's called a systematic review. If we want to proceed to a meta-analysis, then we would um, combine effect sizes using some statistical model to provide a single estimate. Uh, we would try to explain the causes of heterogeneity and rate our confidence or certainty in the estimates, which is the most important final step as we will discuss today. So that was all a brief and a quick rundown of what we talked about last time. The first topic of today's session is risk of bias assessment. So this is a very essential step. Why is that? We have empirical evidence of the effect of bias now, empirical, you, you, I don't know if, if all of you know what empirical is, but you can think of uh, reasons to do something in life as being either hypothesis-based or empirical. So hypothesis-based means we hypothesize that uh, this 
if we do something, then something else will, will happen. This is the hypothesis. Empirical means we've actually seen it. So we've obs we have observed that if we do something, something else will happen. So that is the difference between hypothesis-based and something we observed or, or empirical. So empirical evidence of bias, um, it has been shown that studies that were uh, randomized controlled trials, if these studies did not conceal allocation, the effect will be exaggerated by 41 percent. So what does allocation concealment mean? Allocation concealment means when you're conducting a randomized trial, um, you want the person who allocate patients to intervention or control arm to be uh, unaware of their assignment. So this is the study coordinator or the person who is doing the allocation. It's very critical to do that in randomized trials because obviously if the person doing the assignment knows where the patient is going, they may interfere with the, with the process of assignment. So you can imagine uh, 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 if someone really likes, say, angioplasty, and we're comparing angioplasty to bypass surgery. If this person really believes that angioplasty is superior, when they get a patient who needs to be randomized to angioplasty versus bypass, this person uh, will look at the patient and say, oh, this patient is, is too sick, uh, I'm not going to send them to um, the angioplasty arm. So they can interfere with the randomization if they knew where the assignment is, is uh, going to be. And this is prevented usually by using uh, sometimes central uh, computerized assignment and things like that. Uh, but if a study does not do that, then we're showing here that the effect is exaggerated by 51 percent. Uh, by 41 percent, sorry. Uh, the next element in the risk of bias is blinding. And I think that's a, a pretty basic concept that you probably all should know, that if you don't blind, you can also get bias results and this study empirically showed that uh, no blinding will exaggerate the effect by 17 percent. So the bottom line of all this is that inadequate or poor randomized trial methodology is associated with bias which will lead to exaggeration of the treatment effect. So we want when we do a systematic review to look at for the risk of bias. Now you've seen this evidence pyramid and you may be tempted to say, okay, well, we're going to say randomized trials have less risk of bias than cohort studies, uh, cohort studies have less risk of bias than case control studies, and so forth. So you can, you may be tempted to use a study design as a marker for the risk of bias. But, the, but that does not make um, a lot of sense because I just showed you empirically that even within randomized trials, there's a range or a spectrum of bias. So I wouldn't use the, random, the, the evidence pyramid or the study design to decide the risk of bias, and I would consider bias as being a spectrum. Um, so you can see here that randomized trials with blinding uh, and good follow-up are much more protected from bias than those that are not, but are blinded than those that are not blinded, and then you go down the spectrum so you can have cohort studies with, with good follow-up versus one with less versus case control. So, so basically what, what this is showing is that this pyramid really is, is not very helpful. It is helpful to some extent. I mean, you can just say, okay, a randomized trial is probably more protected from bias than an observational study. So it does help to some extent, but really you need to go deeper and look into these other elements such as blinding, allocation concealment, and loss to follow-up, and so forth. So it's a spectrum. It's really not a rigid uh, steps based on the study design. So this, this will be a question to the, to the audience. What is this uh, study design, right? So this is from PubMed. It's a study design that says in its title that it's a, uh, it's a trial. It's a comparative trial. If you read its methods, you see that it says here it's a retrospective randomized study. So that's obviously is impossible, right? You cannot retrospectively randomize people. So if you just kind of read the abstract or the title or just depend on the study design without going into these 
methodologic features that I just described, such as blinding and so forth, you will make the wrong decision about the risk of bias. What about some scoring tools? So there are scoring tools like the Haddad uh, scale or, or score, which gives points. So points for allocation concealment, point for randomization and so forth. Now these scales were very helpful back in the 80s and 90s, um, but again, assigning points does not make a lot of sense because um, obviously double blind may be very important when the intervention uh, is, say, uh, let's give this example. Say the intervention is a diabetes drug and the outcome is the quality of life. So there, if there's no blinding, the outcome would be greatly biased. But if the outcome was uh, hemoglobin A1C, which is an objective measure, it's a laboratory measure, then you are, you're not as much uh, at risk of bias from lack of blinding. So this tells you that uh, blinding can be can have different impact on bias in different situations. So assigning a point, a one point to blinding doesn't make a lot of sense. So we don't want to use these scoring tools either. So what do we use? We want to look at actual elements. We don't want to look at points. We don't want to look at a pyramid. We want to look at the specific bias protection measures such as allocation concealment, following intention to treat principle, blinding, loss to follow up, and early stopping for benefit. Early stopping for benefit exaggerates the treatment effect by almost 30 percent, or a little more than 30 percent. That's when, when, when the authors of the study or the investigators decide to stop the study because they observed a large effect. Uh, for non-randomized trials, observational studies, we look at how the cohorts of the study were selected, are they comparable, and we look at how the outcome was ascertained and how the exposure was ascertained. So this would be a good approach to use. This is the Cochrane Risk of Bias tool. You see that it looks at these elements that I described distinctly, and it rates them for every study, giving either a yes or no or unclear. And then from once that's done, you can summarize that in two ways. The first one is where you can look at every methodologic factor in uh, across all the studies. And you can get this summary uh, table that basically makes you able to give a judgment about the risk of bias across all the studies. So the first, so the top one gives you the percent of how much that element was done, and then the the bottom one gives you just for for the whole cohort of studies. So in in summary, if, uh, we we recommend several tools uh, for randomized trials. The most common one is is the Cochrane Risk of Bias tool. Uh, for observational studies, we've used a lot the Newcastle Ottawa scale in our systematic reviews. Um, very heavily we've used it, I would say, in the last 10 years or so. But there's also a new tool from the Cochrane collaboration that's a little longer and not as easy to implement. But that's also possible. And there are a lot of other tools that you may um, choose based on your study design. Uh, for diagnostic studies, we use the Quadus 2. It's, I'm not going to talk about it today, but just want you to know that for diagnostic studies, there are cert there's a certain tool for that. There are other tools for prognosis studies, cost-effectiveness studies, case series, even case reports. Uh, the, the, the biggest advice or the, the most important advice I want to emphasize today and give to you is that tools need to be modified and operationalized. So modified uh, because your question may doesn't quite fit the tool, so you may make some changes. And similarly, you need to operation, uh, operationalize the tool, which means um, the tool is just an abstract question that might be hard to understand and can be answered differently by two different people. So when you're doing a systematic review, you want to test the tool and maybe uh, put some conditions on it. So for example, let's say we're looking at allocation concealment. Um, one reviewer in a systematic review may think of that in a different way than the other. So when you operationalize the tool, you say, 
okay, if, if allocation consumment was done using a computer centra centralized, computerized um, system, then we would consider this um, that it's adequate consumment. If it was, um, say, concealed, opaque envelopes, we would say it's adequate consumment. If it was whatever, then it will be not adequate. So you explain to your viewers how to judge the elements of the studies based on the tool. So you operationalize it, you make it operational. And the last point is that uh, you are making a judgment uh, and I would not use a scoring tool. So just make a judgment just like we saw in the Cochrane Risk of Bias tool. There was uh, judgment. These were represented by uh, those colors, those circles. And it was not a score or a number. All right, so here's a question. Um, so, uh, Faris, you can start the polling, and you need to uh, text me with the results because I cannot hear you. I'm going to read the question, and obviously these are about heterogeneity. I usually put the questions before the section just so that we can gauge people's uh, understanding. So, uh, this says, uh, high I squared value implies low heterogeneity. The larger the p value of the test of heterogeneity, the more likely heterogeneity exists. Heterogeneity can be suspected when a forest plot shows studies scattered on both sides of the midline with the line of no effect. Heterogeneity can be suspected when confidence intervals of the studies do not overlap. Meta analysis result can be only trusted if the I squared value is under 50%. Okay, we will show the question in a uh, in a few seconds. Just take a look at the answers and make your own answer because the answers are a little longer than to fit in the, uh, the form. So just pick an answer and then once you see the answers on the screen, just pick one of them. So we'll give you like 15 to 20 seconds. So we should be good. So I will continue. Okay, so we're going to talk now about heterogeneity, and I hope by the end of the, this section that you will see the answer to these questions because um, I will try and address them throughout. So heterogeneity what does it mean? Simply, when you have several studies that aim to answer the same question, the results are usually somewhat different. Um, so why are they different? So if I do a study, and you do a study, and uh, we follow the same protocol, recruit similar patients, the results are likely different, right? I mean, if they were identical, you'd be surprised. So if they were identical, that would be unusual. So why is that? There are two reasons for that. The first reason is chance. Random error or sampling error. It's just chance. The second reason is because these studies are probably really different. They might be, they might have slightly different population or intervention comparison outcome or study design. So although we think they are similar and we chose populations from the same uh, or chose samples from the same population, but they may turn out to be different, um, even if they were chosen from the same population. So these are the only two reasons why studies would be different, either chance or they are really different. But how different can the studies be in order to be combined in meta-analysis? I will show you um, a few examples here. 
with a spectrum of heterogeneity. So look at this meta-analysis. What is the effect of any chemotherapy on cancer mortality? You may say that's a, a very useless question, right? So chemo, cancer types are different, chemotherapy agents are different. So if you do a meta-analysis here and tell me that well, chemotherapy reduces mortality in 50% in any cancer, that's not helpful information. Not helpful for patients, it's not, not helpful for anyone, it doesn't make sense. What is the effect of any chemotherapy on prostate cancer mortality? So now the question is a little more focused, right? So we moved from any cancer to prostate cancer, still pretty wide. What is the effect of docetaxel on metastatic prostate cancer mortality? So now the question is more specific in two ways. Instead of any chemotherapy, we have a specific drug. Instead of prostate cancer mortality, we say metastatic prostate cancer mortality. So now with adding this metastatic, we define the population a little more. So you notice the PICO is getting defined more and more. Uh, first, the, the I in the PICO, the intervention became more defined. Then the P, the population became more defined. And lastly, what is the effect of docetaxel on metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer mortality? So we became even much more specific now. So you've heard about the description of apples and oranges, saying you shouldn't mix apples and oranges, which means you shouldn't mix studies that are very different. So the last one here, we would say that apples and oranges are not being mixed. It's a very specific question. The second one, uh, or the third one, is there's probably some mixing of apples and oranges, which is probably acceptable. Acceptable means acceptable to do meta-analysis on such studies. The, the, the second one is, is heterogeneous, so you have apples separate from oranges, and the last one is a fruit salad, so it's, it's very heterogeneous, very different types of studies, very different types of fruits. So such a meta-analysis, as I mentioned earlier, is not helpful, does not help anyone. So we demonstrated there's a continuum of heterogeneity, so it's not a yes-no answer. It's a spectrum, and you can see here that it's kind of it's really a, a range. Uh, on one end, we're happy because the studies are very specific and very similar. We're not mixing apples and oranges. On the other end, we're unhappy with the meta-analysis because it, the studies are very different. You can see they're very different. Some are grapes, some are peaches, some are cherries. So it's a mix. So when is it sensible to combine studies and meta-analysis? It is when you expect that the intervention will have a similar effect across a range of patients, intervention, and outcomes. So you see I underline similar and the range to again imply that a little bit of heterogeneity is okay. You want some heterogeneity, but you don't want studies to be actually measuring different um, hypotheses. So some heterogeneity is okay. It's an opportunity to explore um, the causes of heterogeneity in subgroup analysis. And even if the results are, at the end of the day, heterogeneous to some extent, patients and physicians still need an answer, which means they still need an effect size uh, about the benefits and the harms uh, to make a decision. So stopping and not doing a meta-analysis when there's some heterogeneity doesn't help anyone. And a little bit of heterogeneity is acceptable. So how do we evaluate heterogeneity? Visually, by just looking at the forest plot, we can do the eye test and see if the point estimates of the studies are close to each other and see if the confidence intervals overlap. Remember the question I gave you earlier about confidence interval overlap. Statistically, there are two tests that we commonly do. Um, the first one is actually not a test, it's a statistic. It's the I-squared statistic and it, it represents the proportion of variability that is not attributable to chance, so it's real heterogeneity. And then the Q-test, that's a p-value that based on a chi-square and it tells you if their heterogeneity is beyond chance or not. Uh, the I-square, again, is the proportion or ratio of the true to total variance. So let's say the I-square comes out to uh, be 60%, that means 60% of the variance that we see is really due to variance between the studies as opposed to the total variance. Now the total variance co is com composed of two things. One is between study variance or differences between studies and differences within the study. So within every study, 
the population of that study, the individuals, will have variations. So that's what we call within study variance. You can see here the formulas for um, getting the I square. It's really not very um, helpful at this point. We're just trying to, to give you the, the concept. Uh, the one thing I would point out that uh, this tau squared is what we're calling the variance between studies. And if you look at, at the and the denominator here, we have the tau squared, which is the, the variance within studies or between studies. And then we have um, the the variance that we we when I showed you the formulas for the uh, fixed effect, this was the denominator there. It was just the sum uh, of the variance within each study that is caused by the differences in its population. It's, it's a little difficult to, to understand here, but I think I will explain this in different ways in upcoming slides. So I think this concept will become clearer. All right, so I'm going to show you now some examples and see if you can, um, if you were a live audience, you would guess whether there's a lot of heterogeneity or not a lot of heterogeneity. So if we look at this forest plot, I would ask the audience here, do you think there's a lot of heterogeneity here or not? Uh, so, if you just do the eye test, just look at it, you can see that the point estimates are very different from each other, right? So these two studies are showing relative risk of 0 0.14, 0 0.10. These studies are showing point estimates that are over one. So they're really different. So these two are very different from this. So we expect a lot of heterogeneity. We also look at the confidence interval. So this confidence interval does not overlap with this one. So this confidence interval overlaps with this one, but not with this one or with this one. So based on that as well, just by looking at this, we expect a lot of heterogeneity. And indeed, if we do the statistics, the two statistics I mentioned earlier, the I squared here will be 95%, it's very high. So if you remember the formula for it, it means there's a lot of between study heterogeneity. And the p-value for the heterogeneity test is significant, it's very high as well. So this is a very heterogeneous situation. This is apples and oranges. So if we uh, use the fruit analogy, this would be apples and oranges. This is not a, a meta-analysis that I would trust. How about this one? If we do the same thing, we see that the point estimates are very similar. The confidence interval greatly overlap. In fact, this confidence interval is completely inside this confidence interval. So based on this, we think the heterogeneity should be very low. And indeed, the I square here is 0%. The p-value is very high, which means there's minimal or no heterogeneity. So this is the situation where the apples are not mixed with the oranges. How about this one? So I use this one to confuse people um, because some people here, when, when, we, when I presented this, a few months ago, a lot of people said there's heterogeneity here because these two studies are showing benefit and these two studies are showing harm. So they're heterogeneous. Uh, so let's say the outcome is mortality. So these two studies are on the left, so they're reducing mortality. You see the estimates are less than one. These two, two studies are on the right, so they're increasing mortality. You see the relative risk here is about one. So people may, may tend to say here right away that there is heterogeneity here, but actually if you look at the uh, point estimates, they're pretty close to each other. If you're looking at the, this one and this one, they're not that far. This is very close to this, this is very close to this. And the confidence interval overlap quite a bit. So, I mean, even this one and this one overlap greatly. So heterogeneity here is not really that high. There is some, but it's not not significant. And indeed, if we look at the statistics, the I squared statistic is only 6%, which is pretty acceptable. And the p-value here is not significant for heterogeneity. So here, this is the situation if we use the, the fruit analogy. Uh, the, there's some heterogeneity, but it's probably not that important. So this such a meta-analysis will be valid from that point. Uh, in summary, we talked about heterogeneity as a spectrum. On one side, we're happy. We have low I square, high P value for heterogeneity. On the other side, we're unhappy. We have high I square. We have low P value for heterogeneity. Here on the right, we wouldn't trust the meta-analysis as much. Here on the left, 
we will be happy and we will trust the meta analysis. All right, so we're going to move now to a concept that is a little complicated, but you will you will encounter it a lot. It's about comparing the fixed effect to the random effect. And um, this table is from the user's guide, which we wrote. And uh, we tried to explain these concepts in a perhaps different ways for different people. So some people uh, may not like statistics that much and are very practical. So they will just look at the bottom here. And, and they will just say that, well, the fixed effect gives you a narrow confidence interval. The random gives you wider confidence interval. You know, and then we talk here about the weights of the studies. Some people may actually like the, the conceptual aspects of it. Some people will like the statistical aspects of it. Um, in, in in brief, and, and this will be in your um, in the in the presentation, and you can you can watch it later. The slide. I'm not going to go through it a lot, but remember. So in in the fixed effect, we're saying that the studies are measuring the same effect. So conceptually, if in terms of hypothesis, when, we, when we're pulling these studies, regardless of the statistics, we're saying that the studies are similar. And the only reason we see differences between the results of the studies is because of variance within every study. So every study has its population has different individuals that will have different effects. and. Uh, that's what's called within study variance. So that's the only reason for variance between studies. Whereas the random effect says, no, we are not trying to test one truth. We are trying to test multiple truths. And uh, in fact, truth is randomly distributed. And we have samples of this truth. Uh, therefore, we, we are including the variance from every study, of course. But we are also incorporating variance between studies because these are multiple truths. Um, so, in, in in brief, how do you use that? Well, the when when you expect your studies to be very similar, you can use the fixed effect. When you expect your studies to be somewhat heterogeneous, you can use the random effect. It's a decision that's made a priori before you see the data. Uh, and just expect, like I said here in the bottom, that with the fix you will have a narrower confidence interval. In the random effect, you have a wider confidence interval. And I showed you this, this formula earlier. So the weight that is given to every study in the model is calculated differently. So in the fixed effect, it's very simple. It's the inverse of the variance. And we already explained why we use inverse of the variance here. In the random effect, it's the same thing. It's the inverse of the variance. But look what we added here in the denominator we added this tau square. Tau square is the variance between studies. So in, in essence here, we are giving weights, uh, higher weights to studies with low variance. And we are making the confidence interval wider whenever we have more differences between the studies. So more higher tau square. So when to use the fixed versus random, I'm going to give you four rules. These are in the user's guide uh, on fixed versus random effect choice. So in most situations, uh, so rule number one, in most situations, we do expect variability between the studies. So I would use random effect. So I'd say in 90% of the meta-analyses you read, you should see them using random effect because studies are different indeed. So the assumption that we, we talked about, that we have multiple truths and every study is measuring its own truth, uh, makes sense. Um, the second rule is if you have a little bit of variability, if you have little variability between studies, the fixed in the effect and the random effect has become the same. And in fact, if the I squared is zero, then the results are identical. So then it doesn't matter. The fixed effect is preferable in only two situations. Here in rule number three, it's preferable when you have one study that is much larger and more trustworthy than smaller studies. Why is that? Because the fixed, although both in both uh, fixed and random effect, the large study is given larger weight and the small study is given smaller weight, but this becomes more exaggerated in the random effect where small studies get more weight than that is given in the fixed effect. So for example, um, there was a, a meta-analysis of uh, 
carry operative beta blockers um, in um, patients at elevated risk for cardiovascular disease and perioperative complications. So this meta-analysis had, had a, a, a lot of studies, uh, maybe seven or eight or nine, and uh, there was one study in them that was most dominant called the POISE trial that had about 8,000 patients. So that study dominates the analysis. It's the most protected from bias, so it's the best study, really the best evidence. So if we use an analysis, uh, if we use a random effect, that will give that study uh, less weight relatively uh, than what it would have had in the fixed effect. So in that case, using the fixed effect would be preferable. Uh, lastly, the last rule is the fixed effect is preferable when the number of studies is very small, perhaps less than five. Because if you think about it, we're trying to estimate variance between studies. So if you have five data points, your estimate is very unstable. Bottom line from all this, most of the time, you should see random effect used in the biomedical research. The exceptions are when the fixed effect is used. So choose the correct, so we're done with fixed and random effect. I hope you understood that. It's, it's really, um, it's, a, it's a complex um, concept, uh, but, but again, focus on the random being used most often with the fixed used in exception. All right, so we're going to move to publication bias. So you have the questions here, and I think I was instructed to not read them, and we will give you a minute to read them and reflect. And Faris, tell me when to resume. So guys, just read the question, choose your answer, and then once you see the, the answers um, as options on the screen, just choose one of them. So take, take a few seconds, just choose your answer. Okay, here are the options. Okay. Should we resume? Five more seconds. If we do well on time, I may go back to the questions and see, uh, just make sure that everyone got the answer. Okay. All right, should we go now? Yes, we have closed the question now. Okay, very good. I'll resume. All right, so we are going to talk about publication bias. So researchers may tend to say, my results are not statistically significant. Right? This happens all the time. You do a... Uh, study results are not significant, so you decide not to publish it. So you, you say, I will put this paper on the back burner. Back burner means when you when you grill and you have a front burner and back burner, and you want you don't want to pay attention to something, you put it on the back burner, which means you just don't publish the study or forget about it and move to something else. Or maybe the editor will say this submitted paper shows results that are not significant. It's boring, so they choose to reject it or not publish it. So this means that positive studies are more likely to be published than negative studies. And positive studies are three times more likely to be published. Uh, and this was demonstrated empirically. And this affects a whole study or a certain outcome. So you may see people who publish uh, one outcome that's significant and not publish the outcome that is not significant. And the end result is that the body of evidence is distorted, so we only see what works. Very depressing fact, actually. So if you think about it, when you hold a journal and read it, you are seeing things that were shown to work, and you're not seeing the things that are shown to not work. So it's a distorted picture. And this, this cartoon, 
so, so it shows a young investigator and an older investigator and, and the older investigator the more seasoned one the veteran one he's got and this is where we put the non-significant results in the drawer not published so how common is publication bias you know in one study they showed that 20 to 30 percent of randomized trials submitted to the FDA to get drug approvals are never published in journal so people don't know about them so about a third um, in one case of one drug of, of an antidepressant riboxetine three quarters of the data were unpublished it's not at random so it's not like we're taking a random sample and we're not publishing it. we are taking a random uh, we're not taking a random sample we're taking a sample in which the benefit has been shown and based on that we're publishing it so it, it was shown in one in the example of the riboxetine here that it overestimates the benefit by 115 percent and underestimates harm so we only see what works we don't see what does not work this is what's called a funnel plot this is how publication bias is uh, depicted visually so this is a plot where the effect size which could be a relative risk or odds ratio uh, so the log the natural logarithm of that is on one axis and then on the y-axis you have the, the likelihood that the study was significant and you plot the study. So, so why are we plotting them this way? So if you look here, so the big studies will be here, will be close to the meta-analysis estimate, the pooled estimate, right? Be they'll be big because they are, they are significant, right? So they're, they'll be higher in this funnel based on the y-axis, they'll be higher. And the results will be similar to meta-analysis because they contributed the most to the meta-analysis. So they'll be close to this line. On the other hand, small studies will be far and low. They'll be far from the meta-analysis because they didn't, they had smaller weight in the meta-analysis as we discussed and they'll be low on the y-axis because they were not significant. So if we take the studies and just naturally distribute them, they should be randomly distributed in a funnel like this where big studies are here and small studies are here. This is the pooled estimate. This is the line of no effect. However, if we look here, we see an empty area. So the question here is aspirin effect on preventing colon cancer. We see that there are studies that were not published, that we expect them to have been published, in which aspirin did not reduce colon cancer, right? Because these are on the right of the line of no effect. These are on the left. So studies that did not show the benefits were not published. And in fact, if we, if we create a mirror image of the studies that are here, and we redo the meta-analysis, we see the effect size to move from here to here. So it's less statistically significant. It's less impressive. So, so we're not saying that aspirin does not prevent colon cancer, but we're saying that the true effect is probably less impressive than what we actually see. So remember I gave you last week three rationales to, for meta-analysis. I, I will add to those to explore heterogeneity, which we talked about and to evaluate the presence and impact of publication bias. All right, two advanced concepts now. The Proteus phenomenon and network meta-analysis. So the Proteus phenomenon is, uh, you, uh, you see here the Proteus, which is the a Greek god, the god of the sea. Uh, he used to change his image to, um, to his benefit. So, I'll show you here this meta-analysis while well, you see how the effect size across studies is varying and changing. However, we see that the first study is showing the largest effect, right? So this is, this is an odds ratio. So this is one, so that's no, no effect. Uh, the studies are showing effects, but the first one, the first one published after we order them chronologically from 95 to 99, the first one is giving the largest effect. Here's another one we see the same thing that the first study when we order them by time of publication the first one is showing the largest association here's another one we did again the first study is showing the larger or the largest association so what is this process phenomenon it is when the earliest first or, or two one or two studies are more likely to have the largest effect and most of the variability so in our uh, meta meta analysis which is this is not a typo so meta meta analysis means combination of meta analyses um, we've demonstrated that uh, the incidence of this phenomenon can be up to 
30 or 40 percent of meta-analysis um, and uh, I know some of our uh, research fellows now are even moving this project further to demonstrate it in a larger set of meta-analysis so Faris is working um, and leading that project trying to identify the process phenomenon in, in other fields of medicine. Uh, we've, de we've demonstrated in, uh, this phenomenon in endocrinology, but it's been demonstrated in, in other fields and we're still working on investigating that. But what's caused that? It could be bias, so maybe the early studies are more biased, maybe it's publication bias, so people only publish the largest effect in the beginning. Uh, maybe early trials enroll highly selected population, which is the people who have the highest risk, who are expected to benefit the most. But regardless of the cause, the bottom line is beware of novel or new drugs, interventions, diagnostic tests, markers. Uh, and I'm not saying, I'm not anti-innovation, I'm not saying that everything new doesn't work, but I'm saying everything that's new, it's probably exaggerated to some extent. So the effect, the true effect is, is likely smaller. So when you see something coming about a new drug showing 50% reduction in, say, mortality, well, maybe it's not 50%, maybe it's 40%. So just be aware of new stuff. New things published, probably the effect is exaggerated to some extent. That's the Proteus phenomenon. All right, question about network meta-analysis. So if you can open the, here it is, open the poll and let me know when, when I stop. You'll see the options in a few seconds. Just please choose an answer. Okay, here are the options to choose from. Sure, are we good? Five more seconds. Only 40% answered. Why are not people answering? You gotta commit. Thank you all. All right, let's close. Very good. So I will go back to the to the three questions as I promised at the end. Network meta analysis. So when you are facing a patient and a clinical question, typically you will see several treatment options exist. But head-to-head -head trials are usually rare. So head-to-head -head trial means a trial comparing, say, captopril to enalapril. Uh, you rarely see those. So most interventions will be compared to placebo. So you see captopril versus placebo and enalapril versus placebo. So it's difficult to, to recommend a winner or a most effective therapy. And that's where network meta-analysis comes to play. So here's an example. A patient is undergoing ERCP and you are concerned about post-ERCP pancreatitis. There are seven studies that compared anti-inflammatories to no treatment. They showed reduction here in the risk. Uh, there are 23 studies that compared stents to no treatment, and they also showed some reduction in risk. 
but there's only one study that compared NSAIDs to stents. So this will be the head-to-head -head study that I'm talking about. This will be the study that will help you tell patients to take a stent or an NSAID. While this study was, must have been very small, you can see the effect is not statistically significant. The confidence interval is wide. It's only one study. So really, this question remains unanswered. But can we use these 30 studies, the 7 and 23, to answer this question? So here's how the situation looks like. So we have NSAIDs reduce the risk of pancreatitis by this much compared to no treatment. This is the natural logarithm of the odds ratio. And stents reduces the risk compared to no treatment by this much. So it looks like NSAIDs reduce the risk of pancreatitis more than stents, right? So based on that, just indirectly, we can subtract these two effects and just guess indirectly that NSAIDs are probably better than stents by this much. That's called indirect comparison without using any direct evidence. However, if you remember, I told you there is one small study that directly compared the two and uh, it showed this reduction in risk. So in, if we take this direct evidence from that one small study, plus the indirect evidence from all the 30 studies and combine them, that's what network meta-analysis is. It's a combination of direct and indirect estimates. This involves several assumptions. First of all, the, the heterogeneity we talked about, right? So we want homogeneity in, in each meta-analysis. So this is the first meta-analysis of the seven studies, and this is the second meta-analysis of the 23 studies. So we will want to, these to be homogeneous, just like any other traditional meta-analysis. So that's one assumption. The other one is similarity or transitivity. Um, transitivity means you, you, you can transfer the effect. So, and again, what that means is that these, these, the population of these studies is similar to the population of these studies. So you can transfer the effect. That's what transitivity is or similarity. So that's the second assumption. And then the third one is coherence or consistency, which means that the direct estimate and the indirect estimates are measuring the same thing and they are similar. If they're not similar, they're heterogeneous, we cannot combine them. Or combining them may be misleading. So you see here three assumptions in a, in a network meta-analysis. And uh, based on the network meta-analysis, we can generate probabilities. So this is 100% probability. Uh, this will be uh, for placebo. So placebo has 80% or 85% chance of being ranked third or least effective, uh, whereas NSAIDs had 70% chance of being number one, like the top rank, the most effective, and stents are in between. So these are the probability rankings. Uh, this is a complicated network of, of 18 or 19 different interventions. So I showed you an example of three nodes in the network, just for simplicity and for explanation. That's the ERCP example. But the, the, the truth is that you can find much more complicated networks. This one has 19 interventions. This is prevention of osteoporotic fractures. And you can see all the drugs, the different bisphosphonates and others. So things to look for in a network meta-analysis is to verify assumptions. I told you about three assumptions, homogene homogeneity uh, within uh, each comparison, similarity or transitivity across comparison, and consistency or coherence, which is that the direct and indirect estimates are similar. You want to look at the risk of bias, so you shouldn't be you know, fooled by, okay, it's network meta-analysis, it's high quality evidence, not at all. You need to look at the risk of bias, just like we said earlier. And when the interventions are ranked, you need to figure out what's the real or absolute difference. Is it really important? It's probably very small. So in that bisphosphonate examples, we found that one drug, uh, teriparatide, uh, which is not a bisphosphonate, it was, it's a PTH derivative, and it was most effective, the most effective one in the network. But really, the reduction in risk compared with the bisphosphonate was actually very, very small. So although it's ranked first, 
the difference may be minimal or trivial and you may still recommend bisphosphonates because they are cheaper and more convenient uh, because uh, teriparatide is an injectable drug. All right, so we are done with the two advanced concepts, which are Proteus and uh, network meta-analysis. We're going to move to our last stop in this talk today, which is how to read a systematic review and meta-analysis. This is based on the user's guide to the medical literature. So you've seen this um, evidence pyramid, which um, I know that Faris is working on a replacement of that pyramid. There's a problem with this pyramid, right? So this pyramid puts systematic reviews and meta-analysis on top of the um, pyramid here, meaning that we have the most confidence in them. But how about a poorly done systematic review and meta-analysis of well-conducted trials, right? Where would you put that? And where would you put a very well done systematic review and meta analysis of case reports? So, case reports should be in the bottom of the pyramid. And so, if we have a meta analysis of case reports, does that bring it up here? Probably not. So, so this, this actually challenges the concept of the evidence pyramid in that systematic review and meta analysis should not be in the pyramid at all. So, I wouldn't use the pyramid, I would use this two step approach. The first step is to evaluate the methods of the review or the credibility of the review, do we trust this review? If we do, then we move to the second step, which is evaluate the certainty or confidence in the results. So two-step approach. First, do we like the, the, the methods of the review? Second is how confident are we in the results? Because these are very different steps. Uh, this was uh, described in the User's Guide to the Medical Literature, which is published in the book, as well as published in, uh, in the JAMA User Guide. So. Um, I encourage you to look at it. It has a lot of um, it has a lot of explanations, actually, not just about the framework, but about a, a lot of the things we've discussed this session and last session about the steps of a systematic review and um, going through heterogeneity and publication bias and all these different steps. So it's, it's a, it will be a very good summary. So again, the two-step approach. The first step is look at the methods of the review. Did it have a protocol? Sometimes they don't. Did it have a sensible question? If did, was everything done in duplicate? You know, selecting the studies, was it done in, by two? Was appraising the risk of bias was done in two? Uh, and was the search comprehensive? Multiple databases, multiple synonyms? Did they have medical librarians? So you have here a bunch of questions that can give the review either thumbs up or thumbs down. Either use it or don't use it. If you like the review, it looks like it's credible, then you move to the second step, which is to look at how certain are you in the evidence. So we look at the consistency across studies, we look at the risk of bias, we look at precision. There are other elements that you can look at, but these are the top three that are probably very dis easy and well, probably they're easy to find and they're well described in, in most systematic reviews. So was the risk of bias assessed and described? you'll find that in the review. How about heterogeneity and inconsistency? I taught you four ways to look at it visually and statistically. And then precision, the size of this body of the evidence, the confidence intervals, are they wide or narrow? The narrower, the more confidence you have. So based on all that, uh, there's what's called the GRADE framework, which is a very specific framework that has uh, different domains that allows you to give a confidence in the evidence. And this is a formal approach, but I, I don't think you will need to go through that. If you're just reading a review, you can just intuitively look at the risk of bias, consistency, precision, and just kind of make a judgment, an intuitive thumbs up or thumbs down. But the point of all this is to do it in two steps, to separate one is, was the review credible? And the second one, how much do I trust the evidence? Because you can have a perfect review that's excellent, very credible, but the evidence may be of lower quality. And that's the summary. Ditch the pyramid. Ditch means don't use. And follow this step approach. First look at the credibility and then look at the certainty. In summary today, we talked about several advanced concepts. The risk of bias assessment, heterogeneity, the fixed and random effects, publication bias, the process phenomenon, and network meta-analysis. And then we talked about the user's guide 
on how to consume a systematic review and meta-analysis. And again, consume means understand, read, apply, use in practice, use in a guideline, um, use anyway. I think the, the, the most challenging one will probably for you will be the fixed and random effect and uh, understandably so. That is, uh, that doesn't uh, surprise me. It's a, it's a tough concept. Remember, random effect is probably the one you want to use most of the time. Okay, so what I want to do now is to try and look at the questions real quick. Just to make sure that we covered them. So let's see. All right, so here's the one about heterogeneity. So high I squared value implies low heterogeneity. That's not true. High I squared means high heterogeneity. The larger the p-value of the test of heterogeneity, the more likely heterogeneity exists. Uh, that also should not be uh, true. Right, so the p-value, uh, the higher the p-value, the, the more likely you have heterogeneity. Um, heterogeneity can be suspected when a forest plot shows studies scattered on both sides of the midline, line of no effect. I don't know what you think about that. It could be true, but remember that we are really looking not at um, the difference in relation to the line, we're looking at the difference between the studies themselves. Next is heterogeneity can be suspected when confidence intervals of the included studies do not overlap. This is the true answer, right? So when they do not overlap, it means they're heterogeneous. It means the differences be between them are beyond chance. And lastly, meta-analysis can be only trusted if the I squared value is under 50%. This doesn't make sense, right? Why 50%? There's really no rationale. I didn't present you with any rationale to pick 50%. It's just a random number. All right. This one here about publication bias. Publication bias tends to underestimate the effect of the intervention compared to placebo. This is not true. Actually, publication bias exaggerates the effect, right? People publish what shows that the treatment is more effective. Next is publication bias occurs when patients are lost to follow-up. This has nothing to do, publication bias has nothing to do with the loss to follow-up. Loss to follow-up is a different type of bias. Um, next is uh, publication bias can be easily evaluated using several available statistical techniques. Uh, this is not true. In, in, in fact, it's very difficult to find out if publication bias exists or not. Next is both researchers and journal editors are responsible for publication bias. That is true. And next is high impact journals are immune from publication bias. That is not true at all. In fact, high impact journals propagate publication bias because they pick the studies that are significant. All right, the last question, network meta-analysis. It evaluates diagnostics tests. That's not true. It has nothing to do with diagnostic tests. It compares the effectiveness of interventions to each other uh, using head-to-head -head trials and not trials of comparison against placebo. That's not true because it uses both. If you remember, I showed you that it combines the direct and indirect effect. Uh, uh, meta-analysis is uh, network meta-analysis is a meta-analysis in which interventions are compared indirectly when head-to-head -head trials are unavailable. Uh, that is uh, partially true because it also um, includes direct effects. It direct, includes direct and indirect. Meta-analysis, uh, network meta-analysis is a meta-analysis that provides the highest level of evidence. That's not true. It has nothing to do with the level of evidence. If, I, if you remember anything from this talk, you remember the two-step approach where the level of evidence is determined based on um, other factors such as the risk of bias, precision, and so forth. And lastly, a meta-analysis that combines the direct and indirect estimates, which is the true um, analysis, which is the true answer because it's an analysis that combines direct and indirect estimates. 
this ends my talk. I would like to thank you all for uh, listening. I hope this was helpful. I know there were some concepts that are a little difficult to explain in a short period of time, but I encourage you to read the user's guide because it has, uh, especially the book, it has additional chapters that go into details um, and will describe all these concepts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Murad. Um, this has been a great lecture, very informative, very useful. I hope the students have, um, and all the attendees have made the best of it. Um, so this concludes the session on the meta-analysis systematic review. Uh, tomorrow we will start with the first journal club session. This is going to be very, very uh, important for the course because this is where you guys um, apply the theoretical knowledge that you've gained so far into actual papers. And this will hone your actual skills in practicing evidence-based medicine in your daily lives. So tomorrow and, and the one after that, the next weekend, is going to be extremely, extremely important for you guys to, to attend. Um, if you have any questions, I don't see any questions here. If you have any questions, just post them to the group. And we will all be there. And 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 uh, I'll, even Dr. Dr. Murad will, will be able to, to answer them. Um, otherwise, I think this is... This is it for today, so thank you very much.